Google Hangout for the course Greening the Economy, Lessons from Scandinavia. So this is the first Hangout for this session, and I have here with me Håkan Roda and Åke Fidel, and we've got Oksana Mont with us virtually as well in the window. And we're going to be discussing today some of the um, forums that have been discussed by the learners um, throughout the course so far in the first two to three weeks, depending on where you are. Some people are already almost nearly done with the course, and some people are just joining us with the course. And one of those topics that was discussed in one of the forums was about eco-labels. And we have here somebody who's done a lot of research on eco-labels. So okay, I'm going to ask you, one of the learners in the forums, um, Thomas from the Netherlands, had talked about how many eco-labels there are and that maybe there's too many and too much information through eco-labels for the consumer to really make sense of it. What, what do you see as problems with eco-labels in this respect? Oh, that's a good question. Um, sometimes this issue of confusion is broader, so <clears throat> and um, why we get a number of eco labels and also questions related to what they cover. Um, I think a reasonable explanation to why we get so many different labels is that it's a fairly cheap system to set up. It's not as um, controversial to decide upon. Eco labeling systems that are visible to consumers, and that's why they might be look credible. Um, <clears throat> so it's easy to do, and many would like to use this as a means to communicate. And then, when it comes to the different questions on confusion, Thomas, uh, you asked here about uh, issues that are not covered, like transport issues, and this is something that we'll bring up later on in this. Hang out on um, uh, what it, organic products, for instance, versus local production. Um, we simply need to accept that eco labels, they are not equal to sustainable products. They are well, better than most products in the, um, in the market range and they are there to guide consumers. So the intention is to be simple. That's why. Uh, those people are behind the labeling schemes need to simplify and sometimes take away different aspects. Um, I, th <coughs> I think we could continue with another question there. It's like um, another issue is like, would it be better to um, label different um, so steps of a, uh, of a product chain. Yeah, it, was, Olga uh, it was about Olga who sent in that question. And uh, another one, it was actually uh, Annette Van Kohl proposed a star rating system on how to make, sort of giving four stars to the top notch products and one star to the ones that are a little bit better and zero stars for lots of good products. And uh, these are, of course, interesting discussions and interesting uh, suggestions. Sometimes they pop up in the more say, public discussion among policymakers as well. But often they go back to this how to simplify the information. Maybe this kind of more sophisticated labels could be good for the more deep green segments of consumers, while the simplified ones are meant for uh, the common consumers. In my view, um, it's better to get more people to use the eco labels, the good ones, um, rather than spend a lot of efforts in developing eco labels further. Um, doesn't exclude that we need to develop eco labels, eco labeling systems. Uh, but we need more attention to getting people to actually use them. So there's still quite a few people that are not buying anything eco-labeled. So it's a, a smaller, would you say, a niche market that's really even looking at eco-labels in the first place? I would say that it's a niche market in some places and uh, more heading towards mainstream in other. Uh, this is typically in different geographical areas. Um, here in Scandinavia, I would say this is not a niche market anymore. It is a considerable part of uh, the products used in our daily lives that are available as eco labeled. And the market share is 
increasing a lot, I would say. So is it an incentive for businesses? Use it to labels more. Um, of course, of course it is. But I, I would also like to comment there and say that uh, uh, remember that it's uh, it varies a lot on the different segments as well here. So kind of you can have segments where the majority of the products are equal labels uh, with some sort of useful like label. But we also have these more or less useful like labels. Some are some are pretty good and verified, mm -hmm. and others are not to say useless, but they're kind of put there by the companies themselves, and they don't really tell us a lot. So. Mm -hmm. So you actually bring in the core essence of labels, and that is the trust. Who is behind the label and can we trust that actor? Mm -hmm. That's why we do like the independent and verifiable um, type one equal labels, um, but far from all are in that category. So as consumers, wherever we are in the world, we need to learn about the most like prominent, most reliable legal labels, and kind of stick to them. And um, in my view, discard many of the others. If we do that, we just need to learn about a small number of labels, and then we don't need to be that confused anymore. Mm -hmm. So, the, in my view, confusion could be if you need to know or want to know everything what's behind in an equal label, and if you want to know. Uh, all different labels, then it's confusing. If you know a few labels that are trustworthy, then the number of labels to keep track of are very small and manageable. Oksana, do you have um, something you want to say regarding, uh, regarding eco labels as well and you know individual or sustainable consumption? Mm -hmm. I was thinking of a really interesting friend that uh, on the bottom, for example, we have both um, uh, fair trade label and, for example, ecological rainforest alliance. So, uh, producers go even for double labeling in order to increase the, um, the sort of the message to consumers that it's not only about ecological sustainability, but it can also be, for example, about social sustainability and preserving uh, local communities. And then another point is that I was thinking. Exactly with this, if we think about three types of eco labels and um, that is supported through uh, international standard organization, the second one is actually the claims of producers or retailers. Then, thinking in terms of the trust, which is extremely um, important in eco labels, um, it is then becomes the trust towards the brand name of dealer. And this is also something which consumers maybe feel that ISO certified or supported eco labels, they are sort of at very international level and consumers just have a hard time to relate to them. But if they are uh, recognizing labels of a local um, or maybe national retailer, then they have much closer relation and also trust uh, in this specific retailer. So I'm saying that. Uh, also, I mean, it's nothing wrong with uh, um, second type labels as long as they are supported by by the necessary. Maybe also sometimes they bring in third party uh, certifiers or auditors to increase the value of their uh, labels. So I think it's it, both kind of development is important that you know it's it's the the mainstream so to say labels, but also from local retailers to which people can. A much easier relation. You add to a question by Alex J on uh, multiple mm. labels, equal label, yeah. and, for instance, FSA. Mm. Need to keep in mind they address slightly different parts of the life cycle, and the sorry, main equal labels, the type one equal labels, they tend to integrate with the more specific ones, could be FSC. Green Stewardship Council, sometimes fair trade, but they bring in their criteria in their end. But what is also interesting, if we think about um, labels, uh, which we find about, uh, for example, uh, the type of plastic this packaging is made of, or whether it's hazardous chemical or not. So in a way, on one hand, they are not eco-labels as we know them, but on the other hand, they do address the, um, the last 10 Of life, but we never think about them. <laughs> so 
adding all these labels that again it may create confusion uh, for consumers who do not know that for example this usual the grüne punkt the german um, recycling uh, label many people associate still it with that it's the green product although it has nothing to do with it it's just the packaging so there is i can understand that people are confused since it takes us 15 minutes to explain the simple <laughs> deal with the eco label but, but I think, I, I think uh, there's also an opportunity here for us as individual consumers to actually spend uh, five minutes or even three minutes of research on what an eco label is and what criteria you are. I mean, yeah. for, for most of those re well recognized eco labels, there are criteria mm -hmm. out there on, on the web, and it's not actually it's not an answer difficult Absolutely. to go out there and just okay, I wonder what my toilet paper is now. You know, you go out and check what criteria they have, and then you actually learn a little bit. It's kind of fun as well because you actually you learn a bit about how you actually how you actually produce uh, the stuff and, and so on. So it's a it's a pretty helpful journey overall in general, and I think that's part of the journey that we all have to do in a way in order to become more informed uh, customers because then we can consumers because then we can you know we we can go a little bit beyond. We can both understand, helps us understand the labels, and it also helps us a little bit kind of understand what criteria or what things we should think are important. Do you think you can get over with Nick Matthias in his um, video lecture talks about here in Scandinavia, you can't really find toilet paper, the example that no. you use, but it's not <laughs> eco label. So basically, yeah. your choices are all green for toilet paper here in Scandinavia, yeah. um, which might be good as a consumer because maybe you don't want to spend your five minutes deciding which. No, 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 but, but that's for sure. But I, so that's, and that's why you, you have the swan label or something like that, a very recognized label, and that's for you. But I mean, to kind of, uh, for me as a, as a consumer, if I, during a year, Spend look into five yeah. criteria or one uh, learn about one criteria per week or per month. And I will actually yeah. after a year I know a lot. So kind of it's not it's not. No, definitely I don't think it takes science. all your time. But there may also be a role for some choice editing in there as well, where you want to know that you can't make mm -hmm. an unsustainable choice too. Mm -hmm. And that's something mm -hmm. that retailers are starting to do. We talk about it both in week two and week three. We have Matthias and Olga both discussing those issues. So that's something to think about too, is how much choice do we want? How much do we want to have to think about it? We want to think about what we're buying, certainly, but sometimes we want to just know that what we're buying is sustainable. So it's uh, And of course, mm -hmm. of course. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Oxy, please come in. Um, no, I was thinking that in a way labels, eco-labels uh, um, were environmentally conscious people. It should be, all the markets should be like a toilet paper market, you know, in a way our goal uh, ecological, so we don't need to spend our time on discovering which one is ecological and which are not. But we are not the paper. Yeah, so it could be a role for both that we want to have a sustainable market, but maybe for those that want to be more sustainable, that there's also you can know a bit more about your product to make even a better choice, but maybe we want to be able to not make bad choices. Mm -hmm. But it's still a topic, I mean, this is a, a controversial topic with choice editing mm -hmm. for sure. It is, and uh, I think a few mm -hmm. other questions regarding the confusion of equal labels uh, address that, is that. Should we choose an, an organic product or should we choose something that is locally produced? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, since equal labels mainly tend to regard the transport issue. This is, of course, a world trade agreement limitations and so forth, uh, as well as it's difficult to judge products that are produced sort of in one place and then distributed to another while a competing product, product could be placed, sort of produced somewhere else and then sent to somewhere else. So the, the transport issue often has to be addressed from sort of product to product. Um, so, however, transport is rarely included. Um, let's see if this Thomas again. Who, well, also Camilla talks about this. Yeah. So, does local consumption equal sustainable consumption, or is it better mm -hmm. to buy something that has met some sustainability mm -hmm. standards that 
Here we have this example of the apples from New Zealand or the apples from maybe Shivik, a town here. One is eco-labeled, one is not, but you know one better because it's local and which one is more sustainable? From, a, mm. from an eco-labeling perspective, picking up on the life cycle, it often turns out that food product, for food products that the transport is a fairly small share of, um, the, uh, total of, the, of the total footprint if, it, if it's not heavily packaged, of course. Um, but that's more on the general level. Uh, however, the local producer, <coughs> so eco labels, they obviously don't address the lo local aspect. And which is better? Well, it's very difficult to say. You get good producers locally, and you get poor producers locally. Uh, but I think, Oksana, you would like to chip into this discussion of local production. Or does local yeah, well, be sustainable? Yeah, no, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. First, we need to think about that sustainability, what it means. Is it, it's not only ecological, it's also economically viable, and it's also socially just. So there we have already a some produ local producers, they might be very environmentally sound and have practices and don't use pesticide methods like integrated pest management or even replacing um, pesticides with bugs, which they sort of service by service, uh, and the bugs do the pesticide jobs. Uh, but they might be again. My point is that they they might be ecologically aware and and have very good ecological practices, but they might have uh, financial difficulties. So in this case, they then not economically viable. Or on the other hand, in order to bring in to reduce pesticide use, they might need to bring more uh, labor force, which they might not treat very well. So there we have, again, there is always this balancing act between these three dimensions of sustainability. On the other hand, what we see recently, there is an increase of interest, uh, at least in, in Sweden and in some other countries, in local pr production, exactly because of the, um, uh, I mean, we have the global supply chains and we have no idea where apples or meat comes. Many children don't know that milk is actually in, in some way connected to a cow. So for many people this is the main reason why they look for alternative or local producers. And then they know uh, that they can come and, and visit whether it's lamb farm or cow farm or if it's a producer of groceries and see what kind of practices they have. People are mentally aware themselves, they can put, by, by simple questions uh, to farmers, they can put, uh, you know, a little bit of demand on farmers in terms of what kind of practices they use. So trying to get the shift going towards more organic or less production methods. And then also, I remember we had, um, We've done some research on local farmer markets to go there because they don't make any money almost on them. Uh, for them, it's much easier to send to a to traditional sort of collective route um, all their produce. But they also miss this connection with consumers to identify whether there is change in trends in consumer attitudes towards what they what they prefer and I remember uh, one of our former colleagues who was writing a PhD and uh, looked into this local farmer market she said that there was an interesting case that there was a farmer who was selling two uh, look-alike uh, piles of apples one costed let's say two euro another one and then consumer came and asked, you know, what, 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 why is the difference? And they said, I want to know first what kind of, or for what you want them for apples for my apple pie. And she said, okay, then you take those for two euros because those come from the, within the tree. They didn't get as the other pile of paper, uh, apples. 
those were collected from outside the tree. They got more sun than or sour apples that suit best. This kind of service and knowledge about the type of apples you get, you cannot get in the uh, uh, tail. Tumors, this is also, they are willing to pay the additional, you know, price that uh, for local farmers just to get this connection with, with the product and then also with the producer itself. So on one hand, of course, the um, local doesn't mean sustainable. It can be actually vice versa. There are some aspects that we cannot get from the mainstream retailing industry. So local to be sustainable has to come with some connection between the consumer, which is something you were mm -hmm. just before about the individual consumer needing to know more about the product. So having a local product makes it in some ways easier for the consumer to then find out more about the product mm -hmm. because the farm might be just mm -hmm. there and they can go there and yeah and it's good for both the consumer and the farmer to have that connection. Yeah, yes and uh, I mean for sure I mean and, but also kind of the, the lesson would of course be as well that kind of which whatever you buy whether it's local or it's kind of a global product you still have to be, Make sure that you can put your um, the criteria or the environmental product that you want to put. Yeah, so they'll go for both. Mm. Either way, you need it. Yeah. 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 And we have also um, Jason from Canada talking just along this when we mentioned about grocery stores don't have that connection in many times of that local knowledge. But he also notes a few other problems with grocery stores about this need for a profit over sustainability and, and mm. helping consumers to make the right choice. And he, he asks, is there any, any way to solve that problem with grocery stores? I wonder if, Donna, if you had some thoughts about that. It makes me think we had the project with the two biggest retailers in Sweden, Coop and Ica, and uh, and actually in a way you know on one hand i was always thinking okay retailers are in between producers and consumers and they cannot really do much they are there you know in a throughput model so mm -hmm. they have to earn from each product or transaction they make on the other hand for them it really doesn't matter if they sell uh, normal bananas or um, uh, chemically uh, treated bananas or ecological but in that sense, then it becomes, um, they are not stuck in the unsustainable business. They can sell as much, you know, ecological um, goods and, and make money. The thing is what they're doing actually in, uh, for example, Coop, they are, uh, they are um, putting, reducing the margin on the ecological products because they're a little bit more expensive and then increasing margins on the uh, normal products or gray products to compensate for this in, uh, over, not overpriced, but the high price of ecological and to help consumers. And then also, of course, um, retailers, they are large players. Many food producers are not as big as retailers. The industry has the powerhouse uh, is on the retailer side. And if they start putting pressure on producers and ecological products, then it's very, it has a high impact. And they were talking about uh, ecological bananas and some Ica stores are now actually phased out gray bananas and have only ecological. And it, it, it controversial a couple of years ago where there were two stores sort of testing this idea. And they were afraid that they, the consumers would go to start going to another shop to buy gray bananas, but it didn't happen. And then uh, now more and more shops are actually experimenting with just selling ecological bananas because they see that that's what people demand. And then, of course, we have also problem with ecological uh, chicken, for example. We don't have enough. We have only one chicken farms in Sweden. And there is a demand from consumers. So retailers are trying to sort of support those existing farmers, other farmers, to show that there is demand for this good. And if we can fulfill the demand, then everybody will be happy. So I think it's a lot they can do 
um, to, to shift the sort of the balance of um, towards ecological products because they are powerful actors. But they also, when we had the focus group with them, they always um, they complain on lack of clear support from the government to set uh, criteria for a number of ecological products and they need also to govern the player and put demand on uh, increasing supply of ecological goods because that's in some product category problem. Okay, so there's also a role for more than just the retailer. There's also some responsibility yeah. for governments to get involved and for individuals as well. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and I think also what was pointed out by Jason in the forum is that way Matthias, who gives a lecture on this in the week week two of the course, also wrote a PhD with many of these aspects um, recently. Mm -hmm. And I think that's included in the forum discussion, a link to that PhD. So those learners that are really wanting to get into this topic can actually read a lot <laughs> about mm -hmm. it. So uh, yeah, you can check that out. Um, we talked a bit about trust with the eco labels, but there's also been a, a trust issue um, recently with regard to companies. And we have uh, a scene, uh, one of the learners in the forums, talking about how do we trust companies, particularly in light of the recent Volkswagen scandal. You know, that's been the, yeah. in the news the last couple of weeks. And I put this question to Hawkins. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't see that one coming, did we? <laughs> Uh, well, obviously, yeah, that was uh, uh, obviously something that was, that's up there. Um, I think we're all kind of, uh, of, of course, it's kind of uh, something that has struck us all very, very intensely now in the last week here. And, and it's actually super amazing. We're all kind of, I think everybody mm -hmm. into this is kind of just amazed by what is going on here. Uh, Volkswagen being kind of, you know, uh, incredibly large corporation and also considerably building their image on sustainability and then mm -hmm. so um, it's going to be very interesting to see how this will unfold in, in many ways um, if we i mean we could of course discuss and maybe we should but, but what might come out of the Volkswagen scandal but i mean the question was a little bit broader than that we kind of, you know, how can we how trust, trust companies trust you know, companies. is there something we can do to make sure that they're doing the right thing yeah. or to know that they're doing the right thing yeah. Yeah. but i mean I, it, it's it's a um once again we're back to kind of that companies are also tricky things to deal with and just just to kind of compare that to something else. I mean, there's a, there's also a kind of, sort of truth out there in, in when it comes to many nations worldwide, where you find that kind of the, the international corporations are much more accountable than the nations themselves that tend to be more corrupt and more giving out more false <laughs> about what they're doing. Uh, so, uh, in many parts of the world, you're actually much more likely, you're better off by trusting a company than a trusting a, a, a country. Uh, which isn't kind of... It, it might get, be even sadder. Exactly, it doesn't break <laughs> oh, But I mean, I think it, it is one of these things of operating complex systems. And then, um, but if, if we then come back to looking at companies, of course we can start kind of discussing a little bit what, what makes us believe those. and. Uh, the interaction that many of us have with companies is that we actually buy stuff. They, they produce things for us. And then we're back to our original question here that, well, how do we get information about that? Well, many times we use eco labels. And, um, well, if, if, if we're down and then we're back to this and seeing that, well, there's a jungle of eco labels out there, but, uh, and some of them are kind of more or less voluntary or placed by the companies themselves, but may also many of the more serious eco labels are third party and they're verified and checked and so on. And uh, had had there been a kind of some yeah so so kind of that, that would by default be one part of the you know, mm. how to trust things is to kind of using those regular channels. And I mean but what Volkswagen was doing as well was even lying on that sort of Yes, yeah. there is an emissions test and they mm -hmm. were lying on that. But maybe maybe one thing we could say is that they were caught and mm -hmm. and it seems like they're going to be made an example of for better or for worse than that too. Mm -hmm. So maybe mm -hmm. also 
where we move forward from it, that it's a deterrent to other companies to do this, seeing that you know, Volkswagen has hired the same lawyers as BP with the oil spill. Mm -hmm. Like they're expecting this to be a big deal mm -hmm. and to hurt them as yeah. a company. And that's a deterrent for others to cheat. Whether how can we trust the company or how can we trust other individuals? It's always something like that. And partly related to our expectation mm -hmm. on the company or another individual. <clears throat> And in my view, as society evolves, we get uh, more environmental requirements or we take it for granted that these large corporations, they behave like they're supposed to. And then, in particular, a company like Volkswagen has got sustainability in their brand image. When they fail, it costs them a lot. So there's mm -hmm. risk of not uh, fulfilling the market expectations. Uh, will probably be one reason that sort of make it easier to trust them in the future. It's simply going to be expensive to be not trustworthy. Well, that's for sure. I mean, we don't know if them will exist after this. They might go bankrupt. And that's also one of the reasons why these corporations would be more accountable than countries. Because that's a big countries, risk. countries don't go bankrupt. They will still be there, you know, even mm -hmm. through their own statistics and so on. But there's a uh, kind of... If, go if I may add... Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Oksana. Yeah, I'm, I was thinking that, you know, when you don't have, um, when I was a researcher and not having any connection with companies, I, I had very high and ambitious expectations on them. Um, but then uh, when we started working, actually, with companies interviewing people in different departments on, on different topics, we worked on social responsibility in supply chain or with retailers or some producers when you start talking to companies you realize what complex world they're living in and it's not like all employees of the companies are evil and just want money they also want to do a good job and also if they i mean there are always environmental departments nowadays in big companies so those people are sort of on our side but they're also faced with so much everyday reality complexity and and problems um so it's it's you know it's not easy for them to you know do everything perfectly i remember when we worked with supply chain issues social uh, issues in supply chain so they say you know we we cannot guarantee again because of the global supply chains because uh, of, of uh, producers or semi-producers, middle middlemen, so to say, are in different countries and following different laws. The Swedish, for example, companies, they have very difficult time to ensure and really guarantee that there is nowhere in the long, long, long supply chain, there is nowhere child labor, for example, used, or uh, that workers are treated well in all the factories that are engaged in this supply chain. And um, so they say the only thing for us to say is that we are working and then we, we are doing our best and auditors and, you know, show the, the level of activity they have in this specific issue, but they understand themselves, they can never guarantee. So in a way, they are living in this world where, where the journalists or auditors or whoever, if they want, they might discover these are or bad practices and there is nothing companies can do but of course they all um, uh, sort of want to preserve and, and maintain the good image and of course and that's the only way for them to do it is through showing the level of activity but they can never guarantee the hundred percent result mm -hmm. Yeah, tricky with supply chain issues is, no I just want to follow up on the Volkswagen thing because if we leave the specific issue about trust. I think it's, to me, kind of, I find this whole thing intriguing because I think this Volkswagen scandal can actually lead to significant improvements in both health and climate issues. Because there's a clear risk that the whole car industry will be forced to clean up their act. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, you have a, a 11 million or whatever it is, Volkswagen cars that now will be forced in. That will be a massive health improvement so for less air pollution. But it's also well known that kind of in the car industry, when they test cars, they do allow for a certain you know, flexibility, so to say, in, in, in fulfilling these standards. 
I don't think any one of us has ever driven a car that lives up to the mileage that it's supposed <laughs> to do. I mean, there's always 10, 20% more. But I mean, I think something like this, in, in the best of worlds, a scandal like this will lead to, you know, that we'll actually start to get really strict standards and there'll be real standards. So that, you know, the, the mileage uh, stats will be, or standards will be actually the ones that actually get in the car. And then that will make the whole automotive industry or world accountable in regards to climate and emissions in total. Mm. And that, I think, could be a very important step in the first step in forward. When you talked about before the individual consumer taking some responsibility for finding out more about the product, maybe this also raises awareness for a person buying a car. Mm. What are they going to be looking at? asking and mm. maybe then now that it's now on the radar oh i'm going to be asking a few more questions about mm. my car and, and this and that but it is when i was i had to buy a car and for me the, that that bit was really important so it was the service bit the, what kind of quality you get of, on the service but also what happens with the car you know how it's produced how it performs during the use and also what happens with it at the end of life but uh, i'm thinking about myself okay i was lucky i didn't happen to buy a volkswagen but i would be devastated mm -hmm. if if they it showed that this uh, car i bought is actually not performing to the standards that i got information about and i thought that the car is performing I mm -hmm. so that, that that is really um, in a way <laughs> my previous um, point was that we we need to trust companies and not to see them as evils but of course we need to t t test and check up on them all the time because I mean it's easy to slip into sort of unruly routines uh, if nobody <laughs> is watching you yeah raise the bar of expectations and raise the bar of surveillance oh. but follow up what they do yeah. I think also think I think here we have some trends that play uh, play with us there as consumers, and that's kind of that. Uh, if you look overall, you see that our possibility to actually measure and monitor is becoming so much better and so much cheaper. Mm -hmm. So we're getting these sensors that are becoming super cheap, and uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how far away it would be having following the kind of all sort of thing to have a yeah a small knock sensor you could put on your exhaust pipe just to check your your own mm -hmm. you know, exhaust and see what what's actually happened and have a small small uh, you know, yeah. checking into your mobile phone and seeing how, well, how's my car doing you know? and not only the tools but also the knowledge as as consumers know what questions to ask they can be pushing as Exana says companies to do more too I mean we have uh, Don writing in the forum about IKEA and that it's great that we had lots of examples from the IKEA representative that we interviewed mm -hmm. about what they're doing but he asked oh but can they also be extending the life of the products of the furniture and again it gets back to that issue I think Exana that you raised that they're working on so many different areas right now is that mm -hmm. their priority now or do, are they waiting for consumers to say I, I'm buying IKEA I want it to last longer maybe that's not what people are buying IKEA for it could be more complex and I think it also to what they're being pushed to do. I think they're yeah. pushing themselves, but I think that also will they'll respond to being pushed too. Mm. 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 For sure. And I think also kind of here, uh, that's something that's inherently difficult for us to make some sort of rational decisions uh, over a lifetime. Yeah. Uh, for one reason is perhaps that we don't necessarily know the lifetime. So it, many times the lifetime, mm ends up being longer than we thought, and then it would have been wiser to have had one good product instead yeah. of two. But it can be hard to predict. But also, when we buy stuff, we have uh, this tendency of buying, you know, let's not take a risk, I'll, I'll buy something cheap. and then If, I if it breaks, buy. I don't feel as bad. Exactly. Yeah. But I mean, this thing of doing some sort of life cycle cost calculation is it's also one of those inherent problems in industry to make sound investments in, in anything. So it's a, it's something with our human nature, or, or perhaps also a, it's an issue that we are, we are we tend to run out of money all the time, yeah. so we, we don't have enough money at the end of the month, so we buy something cheap instead. What we can get now for whatever price we yeah. have, so money we have to spend on 
But we also have a, a few good examples that people put on the forums of, of businesses doing a lot, particularly with the uh, recycling in the end of life and, and what they're doing with their CSR. Um, one thing that, that we just touched upon in the course, but might also be interesting when we talk about things breaking or what we want to buy is this idea of buying the service of a product rather than the product itself. No. And then that you don't own the product, that you own what the product does, let's say. And that's, uh, we don't see that going mainstream as yet. Oksana, you may want to comment on that yet, but it's something that could be interesting in the future too. Um, Definitely. I hope so. <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting here and writing an article actually. Uh, we've done some research with the IKEA and they are looking into possibilities to sell service uh, of, of furnishing or furniture uh, instead of uh, selling furniture itself and it is um, of course it's different for different products and also for different consumers but uh, Lund is a student town there are many people who are coming to study for a short period of time maybe a year or half a year or a couple of years they for them it doesn't make sense to buy furniture they would rather would prefer to rent it or lease it for this period of time and then also if we look at our daily lives I mean we have all uh, do-it-yourself home improvement tools uh, which we buy and also because we don't use them often they are just sitting in our garages or um, uh, other spaces sort of taking up space and uh, and they um, collecting dust so there is a lot of idling capacity um, in our homes that we have all these gadgets but we don't have time or the need to use them so why not organize um, uh, systems where we can actually just borrow them and uh, use them and get access to them when we need them or uh, now I'm thinking about maternity clothes it's also uh, why why do people need to buy them if they need them in for three or four months so some of us are lucky to get everything through a supply chain of colleagues and, and friends and, and so on and, and that's how it should be because so many, I mean, if you think about party uh, tents and um, all this catering business, you don't need to buy everything to have a big party at home. You, you should be able to get 20 chairs and, um, you know, 40 more plates and so on. There are so many, if you think about it, there are so many products in our lives that we buy simply because there is no access to to them through other means and but now with the sharing economy collaborative consumption and all this kind of renting leasing society now companies are going in they're not producers but they are going in with these ideas to provide access to the products that people need on short-term basis the problem is of course as we talked about it is the quality um, for many people or and the problem is that the producers sort of are this um, delinked from this uh, consumption sort of focus systems where other companies are operating. So it, there is really no incentive to extend life of their products if they are not benefiting uh, from, from the consumption, um, intensifying consumption phase. So there I see that there is still a problem that we need to deal with. But I think it's very positive that there are companies popping up that are trying to work on intensifying, improving the resource efficiency of the use phase through these kind of systems of uh, alternative consumption. And you are proposing an extended scope of the public libraries there, right? Yeah, why, why not? There are popping up two libraries and toy libraries. Libraries yeah. and clothes libraries, actually. Clothes libraries, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think there's also coming, I think with the internet is also an enabler to a certain extent. I mean, you to have closer knit communities where this was common to loan your clothes to your neighbor. And this mm. neighbor. Maybe the internet is serving that purpose now that there are things like Free Cycle and these other where you can get online and people are putting their stuff, hey, you want to borrow it, I have this to borrow, I have this, I have that, and sharing that sort of information. Mm. Um, so another enabler of it. But one thing that's interesting is a poll that was in the, the first week, actually, that the video where I'm eating sushi is <laughs> a poll um, to our learners about whose responsibility is it for sustainability? And we asked this poll in a way that we, we said, is it the individual, is it the business? 
Is it the local government or the, go the national government? And we intentionally didn't say all of the above to let people out of it, but kind of where do you see the priority? And it was interesting in this session, we had 77% of the learners say it is the individual's responsibility for sustainability. And I was wondering if we could get um, different thoughts on maybe <laughs> what extent you agree with that, but also what you see maybe as the challenges with having most of the priority in the individual level. Is that um, actually going to be enough? May I start? <laughs> uh, since this somehow relates to eco-labels, and when they first emerged as a means for um, individuals to vote among the products with a wallet, uh, taking an individual responsibility. And, and personally, I've had in mind that the, a lot of the changes must start with the individuals and individuals being aware of you know, every single decision. And I'm not that sure about that anymore. This is well, of course, a joint responsibility, the answer you excluded. <laughs> but for the biggest use, we need to build our society, societies to make it easy to do the right thing. So somewhere on the um, uh, local, regional level, supported by uh, national and international policies, that's where we can start making it easy to do the right thing for us individuals. Mm -hmm. Uh, this doesn't, of course, exclude the individual responsibility to, for instance, choose better products or services or even choose not to buy anything. But most of all, the mm -hmm. responsibility is on a higher level, in my view. I can I maybe take over. Yeah. Because I'm thinking uh, about the report that we recently wrote, of which targeted uh, governments who believe that the main responsibility is individual. And uh, basically on 100 pages, we tried to that it is the individual shoulders that need to take on this um, shift or transition to sustainability. Um, on one hand, I remember uh, there were a couple of studies that looked at how much, what percent of household impact uh, people actually can do something about and it was uh, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of our own impact that we can change ourselves and on the infrastructure that we are part of on the institutions policies that we the sort of the regulatory framework within which we are living and working um, and then also i mean the governments are deciding on the big projects on the big shifts in the society and they have much more power than one individual consumer has the problem with individual responsibility is also it's very easy to um, for individuals to think okay if everybody is doing their bit then i can you know be relaxed and uh, because i'm just one small uh, guy and nothing uh, is you know i cannot influence a lot so it's sort of this idea that everybody is doing their bit. It sort of encourages, on one hand, everybody should, all of us individuals should do our bit, but we also need to know the limitations and not get distracted by this, that, oh my God, the fact that I'm separating, you know, my waste doesn't really help the polar bears because that's a lot, it's a big problem for many people to realize that they don't see the results, immediate results of the actions. While for the governments, it's much easier to see, you know, if you introduce some interesting policy or effective policy, then you see results immediately in terms of reduced emissions and so on. And then, of course, this question, I think it's also, for me, it would be, it depends on who I'm speaking. If I'm speaking to the government, then I'm putting a lot of responsibility on them if i'm speaking to private people then i would show you know how how they can help and how the sort of the power of masses and this kind of the tipping point when you get 25 30 percent of population with you then something is happening and then the rest uh, of people are changing their behavior and the same thing with business you know it's good to understand how difficult it is for them to work but also if i when I'm meeting them, I'm putting a lot of pressure on them because the responsibility is really on, on all actors. 
Yeah, so Michael, yeah. I mean, if this would have been an exam question, you know, but obviously, <laughs> over high, you'd have to you'd have to say that everybody needs to and you know, explain. You have to do something, <laughs> and, about it, and everybody can do something. Now, um, I mean, there are a couple of troubles here uh, in this respect. Kind of one trouble is perhaps that kind of the magnitude of the changes that we or we need or we are very likely need. One, it's really hard to kind of see who needs, it's not kind of a, a simple one level, it's kind of a system change one level and then, you know, we go further on. The, the other dimension to this, which I think is pretty interesting, is that uh, everybody, all kind of actors, whether it's companies or, of course, companies are the most interesting here because they actually do things. So kind of, you know, have a, in many ways, leading act. But uh, if you look at this here, it's like, uh, most most actors in life, whether it's individuals, company, they tend to not really be super self-thinking and integrative or, or so. I mean, the vast majority of people out there, they kind of follow others, you know, whether it comes as a consumer, or okay, buys that, or okay, no, so what about that? Oh, then I buy as okay, because, you know. Yeah, I think we've seen some studies about yeah. consumption patterns. <laughs> so, so they do that, and if it's stockbrokers, they think of, oh, someone buys it, oh, it must be good, so everybody jumps in and buy that. So kind of, what's kind of the shortcoming out there, of course, is, is people with uh, integrity and who are actually brave, you know, who are and ready to do things. And, yeah. Is that we will, in order to move ahead, we will need individuals uh, who are the, with this braveness among all these groups, kind of as consumers, daring to say, "No, I won't buy that." Or I'll live in another way, you know. And you'll need companies to step up and say, "Well, no, we deliver something totally different." Uh, and that's maybe not among the big companies that we have out there today because they have a lot to lose. And maybe it's more the small and small startups. Uh, today are very small and yeah. will be dominating in a while. And we also need, at the same time, we need brave uh, policy making. Uh, and, and who kind of say, we're kind of brave and have visionary and say, wait a minute, let's, uh, no, we're going to let's encourage those we're companies. Going to prohibit this, yeah. you know, and, and we're going to move to do this. We can't, you know, we just, we have to try to start to make choices and be brave here. And, uh, yeah, so. Um, I don't know, to, to help, help braveness. We don't, yeah. we don't really have all the solutions. We have to try. Yeah. Mm. It's funny that you said that we need brave policymakers because uh, when we were interviewing policymakers about uh, potential consumption policies, and this is a tricky area because people are used to consume and that our lifestyles are sort of quality of life is linked to how much we consume in the Western world. But uh, we got an interesting insight that um, the bravest policymakers are those who are uh, going into pension and uh, because they are the ones who are developing this called sunset policies. They don't have anything to be afraid of and then they can actually do what they think is the right thing to do. Yeah. Well, we all have to grow a bit older. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, you do see the difference that policy making means. I mean, we talked about individuals, about businesses as well. And even local governments, I think, have a big role to play. Moving from US to New Zealand to here in Lund, I'm seeing just a big difference living in a, a little, I mean, it's a little town, I guess, compared to big cities like Lund. And just the policies that can be made on a local level that enable me to live without a car, to be able to bike everywhere I go to buy local and it's it's mm. really the vibe of the local government mm. that's pushing a lot of that enabled of course by national level policies by some very innovative local businesses and lots of individuals interested in this level but I've uh, been struck by just living in a town that's been doing a lot as well mm. and what can happen mm. at the local level so mm. I do agree that it's all the levels and I think that um, we have a, quite a few more things that we were going to discuss but we're running short of time here so we're going to yeah. leave those and say that there's lots more in the forums for people to go and look in the forums and lots of interesting discussions going on there so we encourage everybody to go not only to the forums that we've discussed here but the other forums that we didn't get a chance to discuss and to also be looking for some of those brave examples so one of the the peer assessment activities each week is to look for a product to look for a business and to look for a city that is doing something innovative with sustainability mm -hmm. greening of or greening by and so that we can see what you're finding with some of these brave examples and that's what the world needs mm -hmm. so let's see if we can find some of those 
And we will see you in a few weeks for another Hangout. And in the meantime, enjoy the course. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.